um, without further ado, uh, we start from the motion up to Okay, thank you. Um, I'd just like to say actually that the rural resources talk is Jenny Brown, who um, unfortunately can't be here today. Uh, but I hope I can uh, do justice to her talk. Um, please don't ask me complicated scientific questions. I probably won't get to answer. So, <laughs> there we go. What's the button to actually move it? Uh, I think job control. So. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to talk today about hazardous wave overtopping. Why is it important? Well, 150 billion of assets at risk from coastal flooding and erosion. But it's actually quite challenging to study. Um, uh, but it's actually quite challenging to study um, wave overtopping. Part of the reason for this is because it's, it's, it's uh, uh, an amalgamation of processes essentially that come together to cause that overtopping. And because of that, we need to actually be able to deploy multiple sensors concurrently, measuring it at the same time. Also, the, the other challenge is that uh, wave overtopping is actually quite science specific. So, we need to be able to deploy those sensors in particular areas as well to be able to get a better understanding. So, it's part of the NERC constructing the digital environment with the Green Tea project, where we try to deploy lots of sensors together concurrently to see how we can actually uh, channel that information into now cast alerting. Um, to validate uh, local forecasts to help the public um, with decision making. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, our concurrent sensors actually uh, sensors went with this new type of sensor that was delivered, uh, which was developed at NOC. This is called the Wireless Sensor. It actually measures uh, wave overtopping in situ um, traditionally, a lot of uh, forecasts. We're actually based on tank experiments. Um, they're also based on laboratory experiments with sporadic measurements here or there. Um, so it's a capacitance, capacitance wire system. It's got very high sampling frequency, around 400 hertz. This is really important to be able to capture those, those um, transient events, particularly spray. What's quite Nice about it is um, we've got a big uh, six wire configuration where we've got the wires actually um, configured in rows and that enables us to actually measure the speed of waves as well. We also use some two wire systems and some one wire systems uh, just for portability um, and they, they just measure the, the frequency of depth of what you think top it. Next slide please. So we did two demonstrations uh, during the pre t project, one in the Penzance and one in Dawlish. Now, the site in Dawlish is really significant because back in 2014, this is where um, the ceiling collapsed and the railway line collapsed due to storm events due to coastal erosion and flooding. Um, so our concurrent sensors uh, that we had actually in Dawlish, we had our we had almost like a sentinel of uh, wave topping uh, sensors. So right on the rest, we had our big six wire configuration. We then had our smaller configurations um, just in front of the railway line, which runs on the, the seafront there. Um, and we also had smaller sensors that are situated in someone's garden behind the railway line. This is where we could actually measure the inland distribution of wave over topping. This was deployed alongside a um, beach profile laser sensor as well, which was able to take the profile of um, the beach, particularly at low tide. Beach level has significant impact on wave over topping. Uh, we have an alarm monitor 
And then in addition to that, we were also taking lots of information from established sensor monitoring networks. It was situated um, close by, so we were, we were tapping into the Environment Agency APIs, uh, the Channel Coastal Observatory APIs, uh, the Met Office as well. We were getting sea level data, wave data, um, river and rainfall data as well. And it's like this. Next slide, please. So, for the first time, we were actually able to do show deploy all of these sensors and get concurrent measurements. And for the first time, we were able to actually put high resolution against um, local forecasts. So here, from the University of Plymouth's Sweet Owl uh, model, which actually issues way over top of the mm -hmm. South region. Next slide, please. So traditionally, um, the OWL model actually takes um, measurements of each profile used from the Southwest uh, monitoring program. Um, and this is the, uh, the, the far figure. Um, beach profiles from this program are only ever measured twice a year, so not very frequently. But when you actually look at the B scan data, um, from the door, as you can see, that the, um, the, the beach profile actually varies quite a lot. Next slide, thanks. So, just to illustrate this point and the impact that it might actually have on issuing alerts and hazard levels, um, this graph shows the OWL data over March 2022, the OWL prediction model. Uh, is in the black line, uh, and then the the purple is actually the model with the new in situ data in it. And you can see that we're getting a bit of an envelope of error. So, in particular, uh, where I've highlighted uh, red, the OWL model would issue um, hazard levels. Uh, or lower hazard levels for dangerous pedestrians. But then when we actually start using the in-situ data, you can see we're starting to push towards a much higher level of danger for pedestrians, but also uh, to property. Next slide, please. So one of the things we wanted to do was to see if we could actually start issuing um, hazard alerts, now casting this wave over topping data since we now have an institute center that can do this. So we actually turned this rather large sensor into uh, an Internet of Things uh, sensor. So we essentially connected it to the internet, and got it to send its data over the cellular, and drop it directly into an API. And then from there, you can, you can access the data in uh, a multitude of formats. This is all public, publicly available. Um, do you want to click on? I think there might be something else that comes in. Yes, we talked about that. Uh, in addition to this, we wanted to actually bring in lots of um, of the environmental conditions that are happening at the same time, so that we can have all this information in one place. So we've got data from the Environment Agency, Met Office, and Channel Coastal Observatory. Next slide, please. So. Now we've got all this data into an API, we essentially decided to have a bit of it demonstrating a public interface uh, where we could actually issue those hazards and alerts. So we built a little dashboard um, for showing uh, the way they were talking data. We used a, a traffic light system to help the public understand what might be hazardous about this new type of data and we combined that with all of the um, environmental data uh, that was collected in those APIs. Uh, what's interesting, um, if we compare the way data topping sensors like the sea wall edge um, and at the railway wall, uh, you can see that a significant amount of wave topping actually not only reaches the front of the sea wall but it actually reaches the railway line as well. Next slide, please. 
So we started looking at what kind of conditions, environmental conditions might actually affect where we were talking. Um, in this particular um, illustration, we've got the different environmental um, conditions and we plotted their distribution against um, the number of wavelengths uh, over top of the waves in the measures during our um, deployment. Uh, the top graphs are the seawall edge, and the bottom graph is the railway uh, wall. And uh, throughout the whole deployment, we found that there was about 35% of over top of the waves actually made it to the railway uh, wall. Next slide, please. So just some initial analysis. Um, so initially here, we're looking at water level. At the top, we've got the seawall edge, and then we've got the railway wall um, below. Uh, we found that the maximum mean water level recorded during the deployment were um, 2.61 and 0.26 meters uh, on this data. But actually the most frequency of over topping occurred at one meter. So this was actually above the mean, but below the max. We also found that some swell events, this bit of bimodal wave action that happens uh, in the Dawlish area. And we actually found that some uh, swell wave events actually also cause wave wave topping you know, at much, much lower water levels. Next slide, please. Here we've got the wave height. Um, the Channel Coastal Observatory offshore storm wave threshold for Dawlish is 2.77 metres, uh, but all our waves um, of overtopping and recorded in this time were actually below this threshold. They were two point, a maximum of 2.62 metres. Again, we've got swell wave events that were causing uh, overtopping waves, um, even at low wave heights. Next slide, please. Uh, we won't get it. Oh, I think it's just one. Should just be one. Yep, there we go. So, how's our sense of getting on against the prediction models? The way they were talking. Um, so, we did this comparison uh, on the 7th and 8th of March 2022, uh, and we can see the black line. Or the black dots are actually the um, our prediction model, uh, and the red dots are actually from our wave topping sensor. You can see we started to get some discrepancies, and we're starting to get some discrepancies that also change the hazard level that could essentially be issued to the public. And I guess the thing is, is this true? Well, luckily we had a camera. There, so we were actually able to validate that our sensor was actually recording um, the correct uh, type of wave at the top of it. So, for example, um, in the middle of this graph here, we start to see some wave over topping that meets the pedestrian passive level. Um, and we can see from the camera that, yes, we're getting lots of wave over topping at the sea crest. Moving on um, into the day, we we see that we're actually getting at least not a white white out essentially. It's just going straight over onto the railway line as well. And we're actually getting hazard thresholds that are considered dangerous for transport. Next slide, please. So just initial thought about what might actually be causing this discrepancy uh, between the model and um, the in situ measurements. What we did notice is that during these two high periods of overtopping, that uh, the wave height significantly increased. But we also found that the, the wind turns directly on shore. Um, and we know that a lot of prediction models these days don't actually include uh, measurements for wind either. Okay, next slide. So just summary of the initial uh, analysis this is all still very um, new data um, so in one year of telemetric observations over 12,000 uh, waves were measured 
um, at the Dornish Sea Wall. It's interesting to point out here that the actual sensor that we're using was only um, measuring three hours either side of high tide. So there may be overtopping events that actually did happen at other times, but unfortunately we didn't um, measure those. 35% of the waves uh, reached the railway line wall uh, and were considered um, hazardous. And then finally, uh, Jenny's actually trying to put out here three different bands of overtopping uh, intensities, but low, medium, and high. Uh, and she's tried to plot those against uh, the water level, the wind speed, and the wave height. See if there's anything that's really standing out. And I think it's, I think just highlights how complex this process is. And so we may need to think when we're, we're going to do this again, maybe better approaches to try and tease out uh, those processes that are causing the wave over top. Next slide, please. And I'd like to finish that. Um, if you have any any more info, information, sure. please email. Thank you, Louis. I think just before we go to the break, I think there's one question that mm -hmm. sort of covers a lot curiosity that this is clearly quite an intensive system to set up and there's like a critical need here in train bus. Is it something where there are lots of places around the country where there's a need for this kind of system? Mm -hmm. Is this something that can be scaled up or is this like so expensive that it's only going to be where there's trains but might not? <laughs> That's a good question. It is very science uh, specific. But I think what we need to do is actually um, develop the digital infrastructure so that we can go out, plug, plug and play those sensors in those particular sites to be able to help um, those communities understand um, the hazards of over topping. In my mind, I had this idea that you would have an app and it would be like, don't go out now. And then I said, <laughs> you know what, it's probably obvious to oh, the people in Dawlish, yeah, don't go out right now. <laughs> that's, that's true, actually. Um, I think one of the things that we can do is we can try and channel all of this information into sort of larger digital infrastructures and data infrastructures like you know, we can take advantage of the new sort of developments like data commons, for example. Well, we can actually start mixing that that data uh, together in in places, but also UK wide. Or we can actually start mixing that data together with more social information. For example, natural capital, um, and and from there we can then actually build those up to say, don't get all out. <laughs> Your train is delayed for a good reason. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've been along that line. <laughs> it's quite scary. Okay, uh, so there were quite a few questions. About